Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. Well, I replaced the connector on the HW101 just fine and I got into the alignment and other tuning of the transmitter. Let's check it out. All right, I finished the repairs to this area. I removed those couple of pieces of questionable uh, coax that were making that rat's nest and cleaned it up and reconnected everything according to the Heath Kit assembly manual. And while I was in here, I did a couple other things. This 10K resistor, it taps some of the RF energy over to this little circuit that then goes to the meter. That 10K resistor was a bit high, so I just replaced it. And probably most significantly, I got rid of the funnel connector that was on the rig that was the antenna connection. I have no idea why Heathkit would have used one of these. It's very odd that that would have been okay for you know, a rig that could transmit at least 100 watts of power. So the no-brainer was just to replace it with a conventional UHF connector. And now this will very easily connect up to all my antennas and all my other cables. So much more rugged than it was. And, and of course to do that, I needed uh, to replace the conductor from the relay and I happen to have some 14 gauge enameled wire. Don't need the enamel, so just scraped it off on both ends, soldered it, and it's all good to go. All right, it's time to see if this bad boy is actually gonna output some RF energy. And I've got quite this setup here that I'll walk through. And what I'll do, I'll refocus the camera in a minute just on the items of interest. But I started zoomed out just so we can see everything. So of course, starting with the left here, I have to have the power supply, the HP23, inside the speaker housing uh, temporarily. Um, these two guys here, that's my Drake MN4 uh, antenna tuner, and I don't need an antenna tuner for this test, but I do need something that can measure RF uh, power yeah, accurately enough, not super accurate. I mean, it's not a bird watt meter by any stretch of imagination, but that old analog meter does the job nicely. And of course, the meter that's on uh, the Heath kit, the HW101, that's just relative power. It won't tell me anything uh, quantitatively. And then of course on top I've got a 300 watt dummy load that's connected through uh, the, the Drake MN4 to the HP 101. Of course the star of the show, the HP 101 here. The speaker in the background which will come in a little handy when we're doing the CW testing if I get to that point. Uh, CW key of course to be able to send some CW and last but not least kind of barely over on the right hand side of the screen if I can get to it right there there's the manual that I'm referring to to make sure I'm following the right steps. So with that, let me reset the camera so we can see a little more close of what I'm doing. Before I get in to see if this will actually transmit, one of the things I need to do is set the bias current for the final tubes. And it's very easy to do. There's a potentiometer control on the side of the HW101. And they've actually uh, put a little triangle right here on the meter. And you set the meter to plate mode and set the controls to various positions, not the least of which is make sure the the mic, the CW level is way down, and then just key the mic and adjust that control until the needle's at the little triangle, and I've done that. So we're all good to go. Got the, the proper bias current according to the meter. Now there are other things to do, of course, to align the transmitter, but setting the bias current is probably the most important to make sure that you don't overheat the tubes, and I just want to check and see if we actually get some output power, so that's what I'm going to do next. Okay, with the bias set, the next thing I'm going to do is try to tune the transmitter. Now, I'm not going to talk through while I'm doing this. I'll talk now to describe what I'm going to be doing. So essentially, I'm going to be peaking the output power. So looking for a peak on this meter, peak on that meter, both me measuring RF power, and I'm adjusting the tuned circuits in the transmitter. There's a simple way to look at it. There's a control for the driver, and there's a control for the final. And there's actually a third little control down here uh, for the final, but generally you don't have to adjust those hardly at all when you're going into a dummy load. This is more for uh, an imbalance with your antenna. Um, so just watch for that as I'm uh, going to be trying to maximize the RF power, and we'll see just how much we get. All right, so here we go. All right, that's kind of a rough tune, but should be pretty close. Uh, I'll work on uh, fine tuning it and see just how much I can maximize the power output. With these old tube rigs, you don't want to stay in tune for the tuning uh, procedure for more than about 30 seconds, give or take, because 
Uh, when you're not in tune, you're not running the amplifier efficiently and you can be generating a lot of heat. Okay, I spent a few more seconds adjusting to try to get it to the max. I think I, I've got it uh, peaked now. I'm not going to get any more out of it. So let's go over to CW mode and see just how much total power is coming out. So that's around 60 watts and it was fluttering a little bit. Yeah, so 60 watts should be a bit higher than that. It should be closer to 100 uh, on fresh tubes and a fresh rig. So um, it's good. It's telling me that the entire chain is working and I can generate RF, uh, but it's not as strong as it should be. And certainly there could be an issue with uh, alignment as I go through it and see if there's some things that do need to be adjusted. Could have some weak tubes, not the least of which could be weak 6146s back in the, the final amplifier. And it could be uh, poorly neutralized. Uh, a little bit of fluttering might be an indicator that I do need to adjust the neutralization and damp down some of that oscillation that, that's going on there. But certainly it's a lot easier to try to troubleshoot and fix a rig that's working to get it to work even better rather than something that was just dead. And I almost forgot, I got to test and see if I can transmit on single sideband. So I got my modified Drake mic here connected and let's watch for uh, power peaks when I key the mic. All right, it looks like it's transmitting. I'm seeing some output and probably a little overdrive because according to the manual, I'm only supposed to peak up around six, I think, on the meter. But I can adjust the, the volume, uh, the magnitude rather, of the audio going in. So this is encouraging. It looks like it's actually transmitting single sideband. Alignment is a fairly lengthy process. After all, there's a receiver and a transmitter to align here, and they interact. So it all adds up to something that would probably make for a boring and lengthy episode. So what I'm going to do instead is just go through the highlights and talk about the issues that I found. As far as the procedure goes, you align the receiver first and then the transmitter. There's seven detailed pages in the assembly manual, but there's also this great procedure put together by Greg Lotta, amateur call sign AA8V. Greg added some very handy explanations for each step, plus quite a few tips for making it go smoother. All right, diving in, the first issue happened while I was setting the heterodyne oscillator voltages. The process is simple. There's a single coil to adjust for each band switch position, and the target range for the grid to ground voltage at tube V19 is minus two volts to minus half a volt. The response curve is not symmetrical. One side of the peak is noticeably sharper slope than the other as you tune the coil slug. You want to be on the shallow slope side. Now all bands dialed in easily with the exception of 29.5 megahertz. It never budged from around 100 millivolts despite how much I tuned the coil. It was essentially dead. Looking closer at the manual, I found these very suspicious handwritten notes that imply this section was modified. Possibly the stock 38.395 megahertz crystal in the 29.5 megahertz band slot was replaced with a 41.605 megahertz crystal. Well, a five minute internet search turned up a hack from the early 1970s to convert that band position to six meters. Now, in addition to changing that crystal, apparently uh, that hack involved cutting some PC board traces, drilling holes through some of the PC boards to route wires from one section to another, and even adding some additional switch contacts and coils. And sure enough, there's evidence right here that this rig was indeed hacked up for that mod. So I spent a couple hours cross-referencing the assembly manual steps for this area, and from what I can tell, whatever mods were made have been reversed. I cannot see the writing on that suspect crystal, so I can only assume it's still the incorrect one, and that's why the heterodyne oscillator won't work. But no big deal, this only means the top 500 kilohertz of the 10 meter band is inaccessible, and I can live without that for now. Moving on, the next step is to peak the driver plate and grid coils, and there's a pair of them for each band, and they're interconnected, so the order in which you do it is important. Now, I really spun my wheels on this effort. No matter how much I tried, I just could not get that calibrator signal to peak strongly and peak consistently, and as it turns out, there were three reasons why. The first was obvious when I pulled the coil cover off and looked closely at each coil. Several had been golden screwdrivered so badly that the slugs were at the far end of the tube relative to the coil winding. Here's where the slugs are supposed to be, but they were all the way up at this end. So that was an easy fix, but still didn't cure the problem. The second issue was harder to find and required checking out the receiver front end. 
I trace the connections from the antenna through the switch contacts and coils to the control grid of V10 and to the control grid of V11. All that checked out OK, so next was to measure the idling DC voltages at those two tubes. And sure enough, several of those voltages did not check out OK. If you recall from the first episode, I said only one vacuum tube tested bad. It was a 6HS6. Now, looking in my stash, I didn't have a replacement one. I wasn't going to spend almost $50 on a new old stock one. So that means I had to replace it with a substitute. And in my stash, I happen to have some 6AH6s, which are a close enough equivalent to put in. But that also meant I had to replace another 6HS6 in the rig because they're on a shared filament chain and they don't draw the same current. So both had to be replaced. And as it turns out, those two tubes were V10 and V11. And one of those was bad. I decided to pull them both and test them. I remembered something that Alan, WA2AEW, talked about years ago on his channel, that grid leakage can sometimes be hard to catch. And in the case of one of these 6AH6s, it did not fail the grid leak test until after it had warmed up for about five minutes. Aha! So in the trash it went. Now I did not have another 6AH6, but I did have a couple 6AU6s, which were the original tube that Heathkit used before the 6HS6. Swapping them in solved the voltage problem, but I still could not get a consistent peak when tuning the coils. The clue for the third problem was the intensity of the peak would sometimes drop off significantly after I switched in and out of tune mode. That action would cycle the two relays, which told me the relay contacts were likely dirty. And no surprise, they were. There's lots of lore and little legitimate advice on how to clean relay contacts properly. The least risky method is to use some bond paper soaked in IPA or soaked in some other similar clean evaporating solvent to wipe them down, so that's what I did. And hooray, that fixed the problem. I was now able to tune the driver grid and plate coils and get a very strong and stable calibrator signal coming through on all bands. And most significantly, my HW101 was now a red hot receiver. Here's some sample reception I picked up this evening. Okay, now for the transmitter alignment, and the first three steps went just fine, setting the tube bias, adjusting transformer T1, and even the preliminary neutralization all happened without any issues. Unfortunately, I ran into a snag when I tried to set the carrier null. The issue is, the 200 ohm carrier balance pot is toast. I checked it back in episode 2 when I said I checked all the pots, and it tested okay then, but unfortunately I guess I was mistaken or else it was just lying to me. At any rate, it's badly erratic now, so it'll have to be replaced. Having to replace that pot was one of my concerns early on when I was looking at scope of work on this rig, because they are a common failure point on these heat kits, and unfortunately there's no modern drop-in equivalent replacement. The best modern day solution is to cobble in a 10 turn trim pot, and I've had to make that exact same repair on my SB401 for the same reasons last year. Unfortunately, I don't have a spare in my stash. I've ordered one, but until the part comes in, progress on this project is on hold. After I make that repair and finish nulling the carrier, what remains in the alignment is pretty simple. There's a few steps to do to fine tune the driver grid and plate coils for maximum RF power, a final adjustment of the neutralization, and a few other little tweaks, and then the alignment will be complete. So that along with me making some performance measurements like minimum detectable signal for the receiver and looking at the transmitter output on my spectrum analyzer for any spurious emissions will all be a part of the next episode. Thanks very much for watching, and as I always say, I hope you're enjoying this series I'm doing on this HW101 restoration. If you do have questions or comments, you know where to leave them in the box below. So until next time, bye for now.